two weeks ago, for those of you who were not here, you missed a great sermon by the Reverend Eric Garbison. He read to us from Matthew and reminded us that all our brothers and sisters, we are all, we are all our brothers and sisters' keepers. He commended us to work for equity in the world. And as usual, I found his words particularly condemned to me. Last week, the Reverend Ellen Marquardt was here, and she read to us from the Acts of the Apostles. She wanted us to think about what it meant to repent. Again, if you missed her sermon, you missed a good sermon. That act of, that the, she wanted us to think about the act of repentance as sim, not simply the act of accepting responsibility for our actions, but that it requires us a metanoia, a change in our life, a 180-degree turn from where we are currently at. This morning, I'm reading to you from Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. I think that these words are in line with both of those previous messages, and I hope I can make that case. Listen now for a word of God. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to them, friend, who set me to be the judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Have any of you ever been in a swimming pool? No, we're not talking wading pools. I want big pools, big pools. We've all been big pools, okay. Have you ever seen a whole bunch of, of mean kids, I mean something more than one but less than five, start jumping up and down in unison? If you have it, here's what happens. At first, they make one wave. It travels to the wall. And as it's returning, because that's what waves do, they return, the kids jump up, and they start another wave. And that wave beats the first wave, and they travel back to the wall together. Only this time, instead of being a little wave, it's a bigger wave. By the time that one starts returning, the kids have jumped up again. They've added a third wave to that. This continues as long as the kids' attention spans can hold, or until they get the water rolling high enough that it's going over the side of the pool. And I've seen this happen like in Olympic-sized pools. We're not talking little pools. Eventually, all the parents start yelling at them about wasting water, and they have to stop. I know you're wondering where this is going, and I can't say I blame you, frankly, because I kind of am too now. But hold that image of those kids working together in your mind, and I hope I can make sense of it by the end of this. Back to the scripture. The first thing I always think on reading this passage is that my mama always says, when man laughs, when man plans, God laughs. Does y'all's mama say that? Is this my mama? This is my mama. Okay. I'm also inclined to believe that that when when you read this parable, God listening to the rich man, and he finally goes, oh yeah? Hold my beer. But Jesus has told us what he wants us to get out of this story. He wants us to see the man in the story, that the man in the story may have stored up lots of good things for in his barns, but you can't take it with you. He specifically calls out the greed of the rich man. Greed the intense and 
selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. That's the dictionary's definition. Wikipedia adds to that and says, it is the inability to understand the difference between want and need. I wonder if it isn't really the not caring about the difference between want and need. When I mentioned to Nate that I was contemplating the meeting of greed, the first thing he said to me was, greed is good. No, that's not really his sentiment. A lot of you will recognize that as being the motto of Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street. In Gordon's view, it's not good enough to have lots of money. You must have all the money. And it doesn't much matter how you go about getting it. Lying, stealing, cheating. He even steals from his own child. He just wants more. I don't think most adults can conceive of that kind of greed. Which brings me to toddlers. Most of us have had toddlers. Some of us have survived toddlers. We've all had the experience of watching toddlers play together, right? They don't really play together. But toddlers and gecko have a lot in common. It's like watching toddlers play is like watching two dictators playing together. Each one trying to make sure that the other one gets nothing. No juice, no toys, no cookies, nothing. Carolyn Wallace, who is not here to know that I'm using her name in vain, spends lots of time with little humans. And she is fond of saying, I licked it, it's mine. I'm pretty sure she learned that from a toddler. Certainly you can't find fault with toddlers. They don't have the life experience to know that sharing will mean, does not mean that they will go without. They don't understand economic theory. They've never been told that life is not a zero-sum game. Even if you try to explain it to a toddler, it's a hard concept. Adults have problems understanding that not everything adds up to 100%. How can you expect a toddler to buy it when adults can't buy it? And frankly, explaining percentages to a toddler is a thankless task. So these are the things I think of when I think of greed. But remember Jesus' words. Jesus said, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. This implies that there's more than one type, isn't it? Maybe we should spend some time thinking about other types of greed. Something less than the toddler-esque Gordon Gecko all-encompassing greed. The other night I woke up thinking about air travel. And minuscule, minuscule acts of greed that happen during air travel. When you put that many people together in such a small place, I think that you are bound to get the worst of the humans involved. So I've got a couple of examples of what I mean by small acts of greed in an airplane. Let's start with armrests. You have three, seats, three rows of seats. The guy on the left is sitting on the aisle. He can angle himself so that he takes advantage of the extra room from, from, on the aisle, right? The guy on the... That's my right hand. The guy on the right is sitting by the window. And airplanes are kind of roundish. So there's kind of an extra spot right there by the window. And so if he really wanted to, he could kind of lean into that window and have a little extra space. But that poor guy in the middle, he can't go anywhere. He is stuck right there in the middle. And invariably, the guy on the right and the guy on the left won't both want to put their arms on the armrest, leaving the guy in the middle to try to figure out how to remove his arms and put them up in the overhead. It's a little thing, very little, about that much. But it's a type of greed. I'm more important. My comfort is more important than yours. How about this story? On an airline that does not assign seating, a young father and his five-year-old son are in one of the last boarding groups. His five-year-old is beyond the age at which the airline says he can be seated first. 
because it's like three. But he's really far too young to be required to sit by himself, right? When they walk in the, on the plane, all the seats are, you know, one here, one there. And all of those seats are in the middle. No one seated on the window seat or the aisle seat will make eye contact with the young father. No one wants to have to sit in a middle seat to allow the father to sit with his child. They end up sitting in the middle seats, one in front of the other. And here's why God doesn't allow me to smite people. When the little boy threw up all over the people in his row, I rejoiced. Again, it might not seem like much. How hard would it have been for someone to give up a seat? Why was their comfort more important than allowing a child to travel with his father? I got nothing. Air air travel, though, no matter how annoying, is not the only place where things like this happen. Many of us are guilty of taking three of the fresh crab rangoon they just put out when I probably would have been happy with just two and somebody else could have the third one. But they're fresh, we tell ourselves. We deserve the fresh ones. Or how many of us speed up just a little bit to get in line in front of someone else to make sure that we get our table at the restaurant first? Maybe we're guilty of judging the young mother or young father who is using their WIC or SNAP coupons and holding up the line in the grocery store. My time is worth more than this. Why do I have to put up with that? I'm more important. Now, I'm going to assume that because I love all of you, you've never done this one, but this one really pisses me off. We've all seen someone continue driving when an emergency vehicle is approaching under lights and and sirens. All of these things speak of me first. It's not the same, maybe, as the toddler gecko greed, but it's greed nonetheless. When we become immune to these things, when we're unable to do small acts of kindness, how far are we from greed is good? So what do we do about it? I'm a retired programmer. I like to fix things. I would love to fix this. Your boyfriend dumped you. I want to fix that. Not yours. Your husband's crazy. I want to fix that. Not mine. But I don't have a fix for this. I wish I did. So here's what I think. I think that the first thing we have to do is recognize our own nature. So this is my confession to you, my friends, before you and my God. We need to recognize the selfish things that we do on a day-to-day basis and try to change our behavior, metanoia. For me, I must admit that I always give myself just a little bit more ice cream when I'm getting ice cream for Nate and I. I noticed. I thought you did. That's why I always sat behind him, so he can't see that my bowl has more. Okay, since I wrote that, I have been giving him the bowl with more. I promise, I'm trying to change. I have to admit that I often lay in bed and pretend to be asleep so that Nate will go and make the coffee. I'm pretty sure it's just because he's better at it than I am. let's Let's go with that. I have to admit that sometimes I wash, walk right past that dishwasher knowing darn good and well that it's full and it needs to be unloaded. But if I walk past it, Nate will do it in a little bit. He will. Now you're thinking, if those are the worst of your problems, you're probably doing pretty good. All right, well, those are not the least of my offenses. I'm going to admit to being addicted to instant gratification that is Amazon. I want it. I search for it. I order it. It shows up at my house in two days because you know I have Prime. You know I'm not waiting three to five business days for my satisfaction. 
is perfect. I don't have to leave the house. I don't have to talk to anybody. And I get it cheaper. I could have bought it somewhere else. I could have gone down to the feed store and bought the, the medicine I needed for the goats. It would have been a little more expensive. I would have had to leave the house, and I would have had to talk to Kelly. Kelly's very nice. Kelly owns the feed store. In the long run, though, if I had done that, if I had gone to see Kelly, I'd be helping put food on her table. Jeff Bezos could give a darn less if I spend money with him. It will not make any difference to him. But that $22 that I spent on medicine for the goats, that'll make a difference to Kelly. I have to admit, and this is really the hard one, that I want you guys to think I'm a good person without doing any of the work to actually be a good person. I want to be an activist. I want you to think I'm an activist. But I'm really not an activist. I'm too darn lazy. I am adamant that people should have the right to vote. As long as I can be adamant from my recliner in my living room. Don't make me go out and talk to people, good Lord. I am enraged by the school to prison pipeline. I don't know what to do about it, so I don't. I hate the for-profit system, jail system, prison system. Same problem. I don't know what to do about it, so I just don't do anything. I want people to think I'm truly thoughtful. I give away chicken eggs nearly every Sunday. I didn't this Sunday. Truth is, it's really a lot easier to just give them to you guys than it is to try and go out and sell them. You know, and this way you guys think I'm a nice person. Same thing with my, my goat's milk. I have extra goat's milk. It goes down to Cherith Brook. Not because I'm a good person, but because I have the milk and I don't want it to go bad, and so I take it down there, and when I go in, they all go, oh, it's the goat milk lady. It makes my heart feel good. These, this is my confession. This is my laundry list. These are the things that easily come to mind while I was writing. My greed is about my time, my reputation, my comfort. And now I've lost my place. I need to change these things. I need to be the change that I want to see. What's your laundry list? My family, much as I love each and every one of you, I know you have a list. What are the things that in the wee small hours of the night, when no one is around to hear you or judge you, you go, oh, you know, yeah, I did that. But it's okay, it's okay. It's no big deal. The things that in the light of day, you know you should change. If we admit to these things, and if we make a concerted effort to change, the, change them in ourselves, will it change the world? I like to think it will. Throw a pebble in the water, and the resulting ripples will travel to the edge of the water. Ripples of water cause erosion. Erosion created the Grand Canyon. Mother Teresa said, not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And small things, like children in swimming pools, add up. Amen. <laughs>